So I'll talk about uh, provoke loss of balance, perturbation exercises, but this time in stroke patients, which is a little bit uh, more challenging than with elderly people. So first of all, conflict of the interests. I was one of the developers of the balance system that were used at the uh, exercise pro in the research program, so you should know about it. Falls in stroke people. Uh, we all know the numbers with elderly, but stroke people fall much more. In uh, re uh, recent uh, research studies show that uh, about inside the hospital, during the hospi uh, hospitalization, people with stroke fall from 40 to 39% of stroke people fall during the hospitalization. It depends on the a research study that was conducted. Then immediately after discharge, about 34 to 61% of uh, stroke uh, patients are falling. And uh, it stays quite high six months later, 46 to 75. And even tw 12 months later, half of the stroke people will fall at least once. And even 24 uh, months later, which shows us that we are not treating them very well. Um, the rate of falls are, depends on the research study, three times or till 20, 10 times more than age mage controls. And the, the injuries resulted from the falls are 55% of the falls, which is a huge number. And 10% of the falls resulting hip fracture or traumatic brain injury. So the numbers are really bad. Uh, stroke people fall to the hemiparetic side, usually. And since the hemiparetic side is also osteoporotic side, they break their bones more than usual. So there are two two major things have to, to uh, be with in order that uh, people with stroke will fall on the ground. So first of all, external perturbation or losing their balance. And then the second thing is inability to respond effectively or to do a reactive balance responses to, uh, that will help them to recover from unexpected loss of balance. So the ability to recover with a reactive compensatory or reactive balance step uh, after unexpected perturbation plays a critical role in preventing falls in elderly and in stroke patients as well. So how do we test, usually in the physical therapy departments or maybe in rehabilitation centers, how do we test reactive balance control? It's, it's quite e e challenging. So I'll show you what's happening in Beth Levenstein, which is the, uh, the biggest rehabilitation center I think in Israel, maybe I'm a little bit wrong, but it's one of the biggest. And they test the reactive balance control using this, uh, you know, a mini best or best test where they are, the, the patient is leaning and then they kind of uh, not holding the patient anymore, and then he loses his balance and fall. So you can see here, I think, you can see how the physical therapist testing balance recovery abilities. Not sure that it's good enough, but this is the way that we test in the clinic. And uh, maybe it's a good idea, you know, I didn't ask you. Oh. Maybe it's a good idea to, uh, that, uh, sorry, that the audio will be down because I can hear the Hebrew speaking people here. So actually, we can measure balance reactive responses uh, uh, using the balance tutor, which is placed right now at the first level, uh, the zero level here. So using the balance uh, uh, tutor system will enable us to, to uh, test balance reactive responses to unexpected situation, right, left, forward on, or backwards. I'll show it again. So they are standing and they were exposed to unexpected loss of balance here during standing. And we all know this uh, continuum model that shows that when you perturb subject in a very low 
perturbation magnitude, they recover with ankle strategy. And if the perturbation magnitude increases, they recovered using a hip strategy or hip and trunk strategy, something like uh, hand movements and trunk movements. And when you perturb subject in a higher level of perturbation, which is the fall zone perturbation, let's say, they recover with a stepping, compensatory stepping response. And so actually there is, we, we said that there is a threshold where the perturbation magnitude increases, they have, the, uh, people have to use single step response or stepping response in order to recover. They kind of extend their base of support and, uh, uh, and catch their center of mass that they will not fall on the floor. So actually we have several definitions for balanced thresholds. The first one will be single step threshold, which is the minimum perturbation magnitude that requires to recover from unexpected loss of balance with a single step. There is another threshold, the multiple step threshold. It, this is the minimum perturbation magnitude that required to, uh, to recover from an unexpected loss of balance with several steps, not one step. And then there is another threshold, which is the fault threshold, which is the minimum perturbation magnitude that resulted in unsuccessful uh, uh, balance recovery and the people fell into the harness system. So I'll show you video clips with those three uh, thresholds. So this is a, a right hemiparetic uh, uh, subject and he was exposed to unexpected perturbation right and left, as you can see, forward and backwards. It was always unexpected and random, random uh, 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 perturbations. And as you can see, we were able to show, to show what perturbation magnitude he responded with a single step. And here at the uh, left-hand side is the Vicon system, uh, how do you, we, we later on analyzed the, the balance responses using Vicon system. And here is the multiple step threshold. And as you can see, again, we have here a right hemiparetic person, and he was exposed to unexpected loss of balance, and he uses more than one step in order to recover. And here again, you can see it in the Vicon system at the left-hand side. Okay. And let's go on to the fall threshold now in slow motion, because in fast motion it's a little bit scary. So this is right hemiparated, and as you can see, he fell, and this is another one, fell, and the harness system kept him alive, not, not touching the ground. So actually what we think, together with Michael Schwenk, he's here, I thought, that uh, the fault threshold is the best, maybe the best uh, parameter to assess the ability to recover from a real life fall. I mean, from a real life unexpected loss of balance because the, the other thresholds are maybe too small, but as you wish. So there is another model that we, I show you here, single step thresholds we use in perturbation magnitude uh, that are quite low. In perturbation magnitude uh, that are a little bit bigger, people are using multiple step, step threshold. And actually, a, a every Mansfield found that there are really association, a big association or high association correlation between multiple step threshold and real life falls. So it seems that it's a very ecologically valid uh, 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 parameter. And the fall threshold, which is very new, I didn't see anyone that uses this threshold in his studies, but the fault threshold is really high perturbation magnitude and that people fell, they couldn't recover from the perturbation. Keep it in your mind because I will talk about this threshold later on when I'll uh, present our randomized control study with the stroke people. So the first study that I'd like to present is a study that was conducted by Shirley Handelsalz, my PhD student, three, hour, three years ago or so, and it was published recently in NNR, uh, where she, first of all, she, uh, she investigated the, uh, the 
uh, insufficient balance recovery, uh, recovery after un unannounced uh, external perturbation between stroke patients and healthy age-matched controls, just to make sure that we are, there are problems. So these are the population, nothing uh, very, very important, just you can see that the age and uh, the gender are matched. The other parameters are completely different because you have a stroke patients, you have uh, healthy people, so the parameters were pretty much uh, significant. And these are the perturbation characteristics. As I told you, we, have, we had different level or magnitude of perturbations, and the, the, the participants were exposed to unexpected perturbations or surface translations, translations to four directions, always random. They didn't know if it will be right, left, forward, and backwards and uh, six increasing intensities. So we were able to identify the step, single step threshold, then go on to multiple step threshold. And as you will see, we were able to investigate also the fault threshold of this uh, subject. Actually, we, uh, we had 30 stroke patients and 15 matched uh, controls. The match control, we didn't succeed to go. I mean, the, the study protocols, the six perturbation intensities, we were not able to, to, make, to go to the full thresholds of these uh, uh, subjects. So results of the first uh, experiment, as you can see, uh, I am showing the results of only for, uh, of a stroke patients, the full thresholds of, uh, of stroke patients, because the healthy people did not fall during the experiment. So as you can see, in uh, perturbation intensity one, there were three falls, three falls uh, in, in the lowest perturbation. There were already three uh, people with, with stroke that fell. In perturbation number two, there were more, four more people that fell, so we left with only 23 people, and when they fell, we, we stopped the experiment, which is, you know, it's uh, for us as examiners, we, we had to take uh, pills before we did the, the experiment. I mean, it's kind of stressing, and I was shocked that the stroke patients were very comfortable. I mean, I was almost dead, but they were mm, comfortable, so it's, it's always shocked me. But 25 out of 30 subjects fell during the experiment. So we were able, and only five did not fail. So we were able to go as high as possible with 25 people, I mean, and trip them until they were unable to recover from this unexpected perturbation, which was, I think for us, it was great. I mean, we... We expose them to the highest level of, uh, ab of their abilities. The second thing that we looked is the multiple step threshold. And as you can see, there are significant differences between the stroke patient and the control group. Multiple step threshold is also a good, a good parameter to measure ability to recover from perturbation with, uh, with, uh, after unexpected loss of balance. And, uh, I didn't mention it, but as you can see, we, they have s uh, several multiple step thresholds, forward multiple th uh, thresholds, backward multiple threshold, right and left. So we were able to identify mul uh, st uh, multiple step thresholds in all the directions. So it was quite easy for us. Now we'll go to the kinematics of the stepping, because we had motion analysis system we were able to to analyze the, and this was a very, very surprising, very surprising. When we look at the kinematics of a, a step initiation time, which is step reaction time, we can see that there is no differences between stroke people and healthy people. They both started step at the same time exactly, no differences. However, the quality of the stepping was <laughs> Not so well. So they, step, they started to step very quickly, 
no significant differences. However, the step length of the stroke people, uh, patients were very, very short, significantly shorter, and the step velocity was also uh, uh, slower. They, they did it very slow, specifically with the paretic leg, if they stoop, uh, stepped with the paretic leg. Actually, 70, in 75% of the trials, they used the non-paretic leg. 75, while uh, healthy people use the both legs similarly, 50-50%, uh, okay? So this is the, the results of the forward and backward translation. And as you can see, the results of a lateral translation towards the parete, this is lateral of healthy people. And for a stroke patients, we, we used two lateral perturbations towards the non paretic leg and towards the paretic leg because probably there are differences. But again, there were not significant differences in step initiation time, but there were significant differences in step length and step velocity, which is quite reasonable, but I, I was a little bit shocked with this, that there is no differences in the, in the step reaction time. So now we'll go to a, a, another study, and then I'll go back to the randomized control study where we perturb a, a, a stroke patients and try, a, try to find out whether their balance were better. But in this study, we, we, we looked for the, the, we analyzed the brain lesions using CT to find out whether there are areas in the brain that are related to balance recovery. So what we, what Shirley did is, how do you, okay. So every single stroke patient that comes to a Beth Levenstein hospital, uh, we measure his brain using CT, all of them. So we were able, we had their CT scans and we have their balance measurements, balance, re balance reactive measurements, and we could do association between brain areas and balance reactive and balance proactive response, everything. So actually we used a, a, a we analyzed brain areas using a voxel a based analysis, lesion analysis a, a mapping, which is uh, we took uh, volumes of the brain, of the brain that was lesioned or damaged, and look and make analysis between where we took the brain, uh, the areas that are, were not d damaged, and brain areas in people that their brain damaged, and we made a comparison using T-test. Of course, when you use a lot of T-test, you have to make a Bonferroni correction, and we did it. So I will show you what are the brain areas that were uh, related to bad balance recovery responses after Bonferroni correction. We, we had a lot of uh, brain regions that were related to balance recovery, but after Bonferroni correction, we, we lost this. Uh, so what we found that in left hemispheric damage, there were several areas in the brain that were related to balance recovery, to bed balance recovery, which is posterior limb of internal capsule, putamen, which is subcortical area, and external capsule. And in left hemispheric damage, the, the regions were quite the same, a posterior limb of internal capsula and superior corona radiata, which is, I think, the cor corticospinal tracts. And so let's go now to our randomized control study when we try to improve balanced reactive responses in stroke patients. And I think that there are only a four or five places in the world that are using perturbation training for stroke people. One of them in Toronto, uh, Everett Mansfield. One in Chicago, uh, Tan Vipat. Uh, I think Vivian from the Netherlands. And maybe I lost some, someone that's really... Um, so anyway, a meta-analysis showed that, that stroke people still fall a lot. That the, the training or the treatment program in physical therapy did not lower the rate of falls. Nothing. I mean, the, the people with stroke improve their balance, their gait is much better, physical therapy is excellent, but not 
in, in uh, related to r uh, fall rates or balance uh, balance recovery. So actually, we follow the rules of exercise physio physiology, which is the main rule in exercise physiology is the rule, uh, I, I think, one of the main ones, but very sp the, the rule of, sp uh, the, the principle of specificity. If you want to improve balanced reactive response, you should train it specifically. You cannot train it other way. You cannot just tell the subject, do, do this and that with your legs. You have to expose them to an unexpected loss of balance. So this, the, the concept is that balance recovery stretch, uh, uh, responses cannot be trained by regular physical therapy or the regular treatment, which is good for gait, for proactive balance, but not for balance recovery. And uh, it should be treated an unexpected situation when you lose your balance unexpectedly. So this is the third, uh, uh, the third uh, paper that I will be talking on. Again, from Shirley Handelzatz, and here she completed her PhD. Because in Israel, if you publish three papers in Q1 journals, you complete your PhD. There is no more exams, nothing. You just go home. Three papers, that. So it was quite, uh, quite, uh, quite hard because they have to be in Q1 uh, level, you know, in the, the best ones. Uh, uh, so we published it again in NNR, which is, wow, for us, it's one of the best journals in the field. So here, she she tried it, she she made a study a randomized control study where she studied the effect of perturbation exercises on stroke patients and it was a small randomized control study i know it's small it's only the beginning but it's it's a nice beginning so we have we have here uh, two groups and we had 34 subjects. We started with 39, but we had 34 subjects. It was, I, I must say that it was easy to recruit stroke patients. I was, earlier I was uh, always involved in recruited elderly, and it's quite hard to recruit it to intervention studies because you have to come and to be involved and twice a week or three times a week. With stroke patients, it was no problem at all. So we recruited 34, they, oops, sorry. This is my coordination abilities, which is not so, so high. So 34, they were randomized into the uh, perturbation exercise group and the other group was uh, biodex, it's a weight shifting uh, exercises. Both group ex also got a, a regular physical therapy because the Helsinki committee did not allowed us to do only perturbation training. So we, they, they got physical therapy and 20 minutes of, 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes of perturbation training in, in our group and 15 minutes to 20 minutes of weight shift uh, exercises in, at the other group. So it will be uh, the same level of uh, participation. In, uh, so these are the, the two groups. I will skip it, the baseline measure of these two groups. No significant differences between those. So let's go to our, our uh, parameters. Step, step threshold was improved significantly in the perturbation balance training group and did not re uh, improve as well as the, in the uh, weight shift uh, group. So this was a significant improvement here between the pre and the post testing and in the follow-up, there was no significant, I mean, they stayed the same. There's no more improvement. Also in the multiple step threshold backwards, same thing, improvement in the exercise, in the perturbation, not in the other, uh, the other group. About multiple step threshold towards the paretic state, we did not see significant improvement, I mean, significant, significant improvement in, in the perturbation group more than the regular uh, weight shift group, uh, also in the multiple step threshold towards the non paretic leg. We did not see any uh, improvement, more improvement in the, uh, the perturbation training group than the weight shift group. Fault threshold, this is a, a nice story. In the fault threshold, all people that participated in the perturbation group improved. All subjects that 
they all improved. And in the weight shift group, there were also, also slight improvement. This was not significant, but I think that I know what it was not significant. There was a ceiling effect here. We used only six perturbation levels, so we were unable to, to show that there is more improvement. And I think that there are more improvement and we could not show it. So, in regards to, sorry, in regards to the regular measures of balance, we found that Berg balance test, six meter walk test, ten meet, uh, six minute walk test, 10 meter walk test was improved in both groups the same. There was no significant improvement in the perturbation group. So physical therapy and weight shift is good enough for voluntary exercises or voluntary control, but not as well, uh, not so well for reactive balance control. What is more important for us that we saw significant improvement in ABC, the, the fear of fall scale or a, a activity based confidence mm -hmm. scale, where the people that participated in, it, in perturbation training did not fear from fall, I mean, they fear less from fall compared to the, uh, to the control group, which is, I think, it's a very nice uh, result. So there are not too many other, uh, other studies. There are two studies that we found that make a, a, a perturbation training and show that there are fewer falls, but it, it, this was a very, very small group, Mansfield group. And there is another study, I will skip it, and give you the take-home messages because otherwise I'll, be, I'll have a problem with the... Okay, so several take-home messages. Balance recovery responses in, is impaired in stroke patients, which is, well, you don't have to be a genius to know that. And traditional training program or treatment program, physical therapy, did not leave, lead to improvement in fall rates. So we all know that. So maybe we should train people also with their balance recovery abilities using our system. Another take home message that, uh, that is that stroke people can improve their balance reactive response if you really put them in a specific training program. The dosage is, I, I mean, we did five times a week, 20 minutes each day for about, it was 12 or 13 uh, days. So it was kind of a very vigorous training program, but it still remained unclear if our training program reduced the rates of falls. So now I will end with the, I will say tak, tak, in tak in, or todaraba in Hebrew, or thank you very much, or danke Shane in, you know, so, so, and I, I will be happy to hear.